Hello, everybody. My name is Brother Charlie Clark, and I am the co-pastor of the Solid Rock Baptist Church in Berlin. And I'm preaching to you today, and I'm here in our auditorium, and I appreciate the privilege to preach God's Word. I hope you're having a great summer. I know it's just been crazy, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to assemble together at the Shawnee Baptist Youth Conference, but I appreciate Shawnee, and I appreciate their heart for young people. And if you are watching this message today, which obviously you are, we don't want it to just be a fill-in time, but we want God to talk to you in your heart. And I'm glad that you're a teenager that has a heart for God. And I hope that the Lord will touch your heart. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to jump right into the Word of God. Father, I pray you would give every teenager listening today something from the Word of God. Lord, I pray you stir their hearts. And Lord, I thank you for all of our churches. I thank you for our country. I thank you for the opportunity to look at the Word of God today. And Lord, I pray you bless all of the young people. And I pray you give them revival in their lives, a revival in their churches. And I pray you get all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. All right, please turn in the Word of God to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 5. I hope you have your Bible. If not, wherever you're at, grab it real quickly and open up your Bible to the book of Luke chapter 5. I'm glad for the Word of God and this story about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 5, I'll begin reading in verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as the people pressed upon him to hear the Word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, he is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to try to envision, try to imagine. Here's Jesus, and he's by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee is another name for it. And the people pressed upon him. So he's got this big crowd, and they're pressing forward to hear the Lord, and, and he's there by the lake. And it says in verse 2, And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and were washing their nets. So the Lord sees these two ships and entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him, that means asked him, that he would thrust out a little from the land. So here it is, Jesus has this big crowd of people, and they're pressing upon him. And so he goes into this ship and says, I want you to go out a little from the land. And he sat down, verse 3, and taught the people. Can you imagine in your mind's eye, here's Jesus, and he's sitting in this ship, and he taught the people out of the ship. Now, when he had left speaking, which means he was done, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So here's Simon, Simon Peter, and he's not really trying to argue with the Lord, but he's making the point, Lord, we fished all night long. Now, these are commercial fishermen, and that was tough fishing. That's not just like fishing for fun. They were fishing in order to make money and fishing to eat. And Peter said, we fished all night, Lord, and we didn't catch anything. But then here's what he said in verse 5. At thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Can you imagine? Here it was. Peter throws that net out. The Lord had said nets, but he said I'll throw in a net. And when he did, immediately all of that still water was just disturbed with a whole multitude of fishes, and they filled up the net. And here's what it says in verse 6, and their net break. Can you imagine catching so many fish that it broke the net? And you young people that like to fish, boy, you can imagine how excited they were. And they beckoned under their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. Come here, guys, help us out. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Can you imagine and see all of these fish in these ships here? 
and the ships are actually sinking down in the water because so many fish had been caught and were in the ship. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Verse 9, for he was astonished and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. I want you to notice, and go back to verse 8, Peter's down in the fish, and he's kneeling in front of the Lord. And he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And then verse 9, and this is our message, I want you to notice it. For, and notice the next three words, he was astonished. Notice that, he was astonished. And that one word in particular I want you to notice, astonished. And I want to preach to you about this thought, stay astonished. Stay astonished. It says here that Peter was astonished. And in verse 10 it says, and so was also James and John. They were astonished too. Now, when you really think about what happened in this story, you can understand that they were astonished. And here's my question for you. When's the last time you were astonished? When's the last time you really thought about God, really concentrated on God's involvement in your life, and it astonished you? To be astonished, it means to be amazed. To be astonished means to be very surprised. To be astonished, it's the idea of to be overwhelmed, to be shocked, to be thunderstruck. You say, what does that mean? It means you just cannot believe what it is that's happened and you're amazed by it and you're surprised by it and you're overwhelmed by it and you're shocked by it. And it's like thunder, thunderstruck. You're just like, wow. And here in this story, Peter was astonished. And my question is this. When is the last time you thought about how unbelievably awesome that God has been in your life and it caused you to become absolutely astonished by God? When's the last time... You had this, I can hardly believe it moment in your life when you thought about God. Listen to me. It's too easy to get used to God. It's too easy to get to a place where you're just kind of ho-hum about the things of God. Just kind of apathetic about the things of God. I want you to hear me. It's wrong to get used to God. It's wrong to get over God. You need to be living a life where you are astonished by what it is that God's done and is doing and is going to do for you in your life. Sometimes young people get astonished about things that really don't matter that much. I've got my iPhone and I think it's probably the latest greatest. I don't even know what update number it is. But a lot of times people will see a phone and they'll get all excited about it. They'll just think, man, you ought to see what my phone can do. And then people have apps and they'll say, oh man, this app can do this or this app can do that. Sometimes young people play a video game and they'll look at the graphics on it and they'll play this game and all that it is and say, oh man, this is just the greatest video game ever made. And they can't believe it. Dude, it's so awesome. Well, let me just say this. As compared to uh, video games and phones and all of that stuff, those things are small and they're really not that important, but God is awesome. And what we need is a revival 
of Christian young people who will get astonished about God. It's time to get more amazed about God in your life. It's time to get to the point where you're just surprised and shocked by the awesomeness of God towards you. It's time for you to get to the point where you're overwhelmed about the goodness of God in your life and where you're excited about the goodness of God in your life. Now, I want to look at some things right here in this portion of Scripture where Peter and the disciples were astonished. And I want you to get astonished about these same things. And the goal would be for you to stay astonished. Sometimes people get excited, people get overwhelmed, people get amazed for just a little while. I think Christian young people ought to be in a perpetual and ongoing state of being excited about the things of God, of being overwhelmed by the things of God, of being astonished by the things of God. So I want you to look with me in this portion and let's look at some of these things you ought to be staying astonished about. First of all, you ought to stay astonished by the word of God that he's given you. Look in verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear, and then mark this in your Bible, the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Now notice, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sought down, he sat down and taught the people. So here it was, people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. And here he taught them the word of God. Peter and his friends had fished all night, but they still were taking time to hear the word of God. In John chapter 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have Jesus, the Word, teaching the Word. And I'm glad, I'm glad for the Word of God. And you need to get to a point in your life where you are astonished by the Word of God that He's given you. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed out, God spoke out his words to men who copied them down. God gave his word by inspiration. God has kept his word by preservation. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7 teach us that the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The Bible says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I'm glad God gave his words by inspiration. I'm glad God kept his word by preservation. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? I'm saying this. You have the very word of God. And God has preserved his words for us. And it ought to amaze you. It ought to astonish you. It ought to excite you that you have your own copy of the Word of God. Let me tell you this. We need more young people to be spending more time in the Word of God. I'm not anti-phone, but I'm pro-Bible. And what I mean by that is this. We need less time playing around on Instagram and more time studying the Word of God. You say, Brother Charlie, I'm not in school. I don't want to study right now. Hey, I'm not talking about math, English, or study science. You do with that what you need to do. But when it comes to the Word of God, you're never supposed to have a time off from the Word of God. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, not a playman, but a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Too many young people know stories about the word of God, but they don't know the doctrine of the word of God. I'm glad for the stories like the one we're in today, and I'm glad for the doctrine, the teachings of what it is that we believe that the word of God teaches. And here's what I'm saying. Every day, 
You need to be in the Word of God. You need to get excited about learning the Word of God. Your Sunday school classes and your church services should never be boring. Well, we just go to church and we do this and we do that. Here's what you do at church. You open up the Bible. And I don't care if a preacher just standing there reading his message or if he's doing cartwheels like Brother Randy Dignan. When the Word of God is preached and the Word of God is taught, you ought to be on the edge of your seat with your Bible out, paying close attention and learning the Word of God. When you're at home and you're all by yourself, you ought to be opening up the Word of God every day and getting into the Bible. The more you get into the Bible, the more the Bible will get into you. And I'm glad we have the King James Bible, and every one of you need to learn the Bible, you need to love the Bible, and you need to live the Bible. So let me ask you a question. Have you gotten over the Word of God? Have you just gotten used to the Word of God? Are you even bored by the Word of God? Young people, listen, that's not the way you're supposed to be about the Bible. The Bible is amazing. The Bible is exciting. But you're not going to be excited about it if you only spend a little time in it. Live in the pages of God's Word. Get into the Bible. Spend much time meditating on the Scriptures. Mark the Scriptures. Hey, listen, memorize the Scriptures You ought to let the Bible move your heart. And here, there was a group of people that when the Word of God was being taught by Jesus, they were pressing upon Him to hear the Word of God. We need to stay astonished and be astonished by the Word of God that He's given you. Secondly, I want you to stay astonished by the mercy of God that he's had on you, by the mercy of God that he's had on you. Look in verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, speaking of the miracle, he fell down at Jesus' knees, right there in the fish. Can you see him kneeling down, fish up to his eyeballs? And he's kneeling there in the fish, and he says to the Lord, Depart from me. Why? For I am a sinful man, O Lord. And Peter was amazed and astonished by the mercy God had on him. If you remember, Peter doubted what the Lord was going to do. He said, Lord, we fished all night and we caught nothing. And the next thing Peter knew, God filled up one boat, filled up the other boat, and it was the biggest catch of his life. And here's what Peter was saying. Listen, this is amazing. And I can't believe Jesus would have anything to do with me. And the Lord did it when I doubt it, pushed me aside. He still showed me amazing miracle in my life. He said, I'm a sinful man. Hey, young people, hear me on this. I'm a sinner too. I deserve hell too. But thank God the Lord Jesus Christ saved my soul. Not only did he save me, but since I've been saved, he's used me. Listen, if I were God, I would have let me go to hell. If I were God, I would have never used me. But I'm so glad for the mercy of God in my life. You think about billions of people around the world. They've never even heard the gospel. And here it is. You and I have heard the truth that Jesus saves. And the Lord has saved us. And now the Lord lets us serve him. How amazing that God gave us his word and taught us the truth about it and God saved us. Aren't you glad for the mercy of God? God could have just left us here on earth and we would have died and went to hell, but instead he gave his only begotten son. If you've never been saved, you need to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been raised up in church. Maybe you're the preacher's kid. I'm a preacher's kid. But being a preacher's kid, being raised up in church, that's not what saves you. Hey, you need to be born again. You've had your physical birth, but you need to have a spiritual birth. And when you get saved, that's the mercy of God in your life. If you've never been saved, hear me today. Jesus saves. 
and he'll have mercy on you and he'll save you. You say, Brother Charlie, I've been saved, but I haven't really been serving the Lord. And I think the Lord's just kind of put me on the shelf and I don't know that he would ever use me. Young people, although I failed the Lord, the Lord has never failed me. And even though Peter doubted Jesus, Jesus still was willing to do a miracle in his life and to show him mercy. And I want to testify, I've not always been for the Lord what I should have been. And when I was your age, I didn't walk on water. I had my own issues. But I'm glad, in spite of my failures, the Lord still has chosen to use me because of his mercy. And I don't care what it is that you've done. The Lord's not done with you yet. He can still give mercy in your life and forgive you. After you've been saved, he can forgive you and let you get right with him. If you've been backsliding on God this summer, if you've not been having a heart for the Lord, you need to get right and the Lord will let you do that. And when you think about how merciful God's been in your life, it ought to stir your heart. It ought to cause you to be astonished. I mean, you ought to be overwhelmed. You ought to be excited. You ought to be amazed. You ought to be thunderstruck that Jesus Christ would save you in mercy and then in mercy let you serve him. How about the things you've seen because of his mercy? Boy, it ought to cause you to be astonished when you think about the goodness of God in your life. So Peter was astonished by the word of God. And you ought to be astonished by the word of God that he's given you. You ought to be astonished by the mercy of God that he's had on you. Thirdly, you ought to be astonished by the power of God that he's shown you. By the power of God that he's shown you. Here's what Jesus said in verse 4. Excuse me, he said, launch out into the deep. And Peter doubted, and we already talked about that. But here's what happened. When they obeyed the Lord, verse 6, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And notice again, they filled both the ships so that they began to sink. This was an amazing miracle of God. All night long they fished and didn't even catch one. And now when Jesus spoke the word, the nets were full. Can you see those nets bursting? Literally, the nets break and they have all the fish in the one boat. It carried over into the second boat and the ships began to sink because of the weight of the fishes. And it was all an amazing miracle that occurred because of the power of God and the power of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that we don't serve a dead God? Aren't you glad that we serve a living Savior? Hey, there's nobody like our God. Our God said, it, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Our God is the creator of the universe. And it's by him that all things consist he is the one who sustains the universe and the creation. Our God is the creator God. And he's all-powerful God. He's almighty God. He's all-knowing God. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the God who never changes. He's a loving God, a merciful God. He's a patient God. He's a long-suffering God. Hey, listen... He's the God who is holy, holy, holy. And I'm glad that we have our God. Again, he made the world and he gave redemption's plan for all of us. And we've seen him do miracles in our lives in saving us and allowing us to serve him. And when you think about the power of God, it ought to overwhelm you. It ought to amaze you. God called me to preach when I was 15 years old. That was the power of God that he touched my heart. I didn't deserve that, but I'm glad for it. And I'm glad that in my life, I've got a prayer answering God. And I've seen his power in my life when I've called on him. The Lord has stepped in and he's done amazing things. 
by his power. I'm glad I've got his presence through his power. And we've praised the Lord and we felt his power. Listen, we are not supposed to be powerless Christians. We are to have the power of God in our lives. Let me ask you a question today. Are you overwhelmed by the power of God? Are you amazed by the power of God? Are you excited by the power of God? Are you astonished by the power of God? The power of God to save you. The power of God to use you. The power of God to hear you. The power of God that we can feel his presence and know that he's alive. You say, well, our country's in trouble. Hey, listen, our God has the power to bring revival and he can do that. And you need to be thankful and astonished by the power of God that you have felt in your life and the power of God that he's evidenced in your life. When they saw this amazing miracle, it made them know that Jesus had all power. I want to give you the last thought right now. You need to be astonished by the plan of God that he has for you. By the plan of God that he has for you. Notice verse 10. The other men were also amazed and astonished. And here's what the Bible says. Jesus said unto Simon, fear not. From henceforth, from now on, thou shalt catch men. Where they had caught fish, now Jesus says, here's the new plan. You're going to catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. You need to be astonished by the plan of God that he has for you. Here's what he said. Peter, you're not just going to catch fish. You're going to catch men. And we know what he was talking about. The Lord said, you're going to take the gospel net and you're going to give the gospel and people are going to be saved and people are going to be born again. I'm glad that my life, God has decided to use it. I wish I had given the Lord more of my life, but I'm glad for the privilege I've had to do God's plan. Young people, the devil is a liar. And he's going to tell you that out there in the world, there's a place for you. There's a plan for you. Let me tell you, the greatest thing you could ever do with your life is to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't mean just for salvation, but I'm talking about a surrender to where you're willing to do whatever it is that he wants you to do. He has a great plan for you. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We're not good in and of ourselves. But whether you're a young man or a young lady, God wants to order your steps. He has a plan for your life. The greatest life lived is a life lived for God. And if you will give your life to God, God will use your life. You say, well, I don't have a lot of talent. I'm not very gifted. I don't feel like I have much ability the greatest ability is availability. That's not original with me, but I like that quote. The greatest ability is availability. And if you will give yourself to God, God will use you for his glory. God made you for a purpose. God has a plan for your life. When I was 13 years old, I was at a youth conference. And I, I actually 14 years old, I surrendered my life to whatever God wanted. At 15, I didn't like to be up in front of people talking, but at 15, I surrendered my life to be a preacher of the gospel. I was able to graduate from Christian school. I was the only senior that graduated from my class. And I surrendered my life, and I went off to Bible college. I came back to our church when I was 21 years old. I got married. My wife was 19. And I started serving the Lord full time. I'm 52 years old right now. Young people, let me just tell you, I don't have any regret about giving my life to God. My only regret is that I didn't give more of my life to God. I have no regret about serving the king. I just wish I had done a better job. 
And I want to say to every one of you young people, while you're young, give your life to God. He's got a plan for you. He wants to use your life for his honor and for his glory. And if you'll give your life to God, I guarantee he will show you one step at a time what it is that you're supposed to be doing with your life. Over and over in the Bible, we see young people that surrendered their lives. And when you think about the fact that God knows your name and God knows how many hairs are on your head, that ought to encourage you that he knows what you're supposed to do with your life. Some of you are seniors that have just graduated and you're trying to think about what's my next step. Well, let me just encourage you, senior just graduated, go all in for God. Surrender your life to God. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So if I do this, that, and the other, I think that will work. Hey, don't go by your plan. Receive God's plan in your heart. Question, have you ever really fully surrendered your life to God? Now, ultimately, I don't care if you're a preacher or a plumber as long as you serve God. But you need to give God your life fully. I would dare suggest there's some young man that's watching today and maybe God wants you to be a preacher of the gospel. Say, Brother Charlie, I can never do that. I'd be scared to death. Hey, let me say this. If God calls you to preach, God will empower you to preach. Whatever it is God wants you to do with your life, be open to it. Surrender to it. Do God's will. How do I do God's will for the rest of my life? By doing God's will one day at a time. Right now, it's God's will for you to be right with your parents. Right now, it's God's will for you to be faithful to your local church. Right now, it's God's will for you to be in the word of God and on your knees every day having a walk with God. Right now, it's God's will for you to overcome the world instead of being overcome by the world. Hey, listen, you're not supposed to be out there involved in all of the worldly stuff and the fleshly stuff and the carnal stuff. No, no, no. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And you need to live a separated Christian life. And doing God's plan would mean that you'd be sanctified. You'd be set apart. So here's the story of Peter. And it's quite amazing. He and James and John and the others that were around that day, they saw Jesus do an amazing miracle. And it says he was astonished. Let me ask you a question. Are you astonished by the word of God that he's given you? Say, man, I really love the Bible, Brother Charlie, then spend much time in it. Don't get over the Bible. Don't let it become boring. Study it. Spend time in the scriptures. Be astonished by the word of God. Are you astonished by the mercy of God in the fact that he would save you and that he would choose to use you even though you failed him, even though you've backslidden on God, aren't you glad for his mercy? I'm so glad for his mercy. I'm so glad for his power that I've been able to see God answer my prayers, that I've been able to feel God in my heart, to be able to see God work in my life, to know that he's got the power to save souls and he can use me to give the gospel out and people would be saved. I'm glad for the plan of God. Young people, I'm not going to stand here today and say, oh, young people, so difficult to serve God. You hear me on this. It's not always easy, but it's always best. And you're looking at a guy. I'm starting to be an old head. I'm 52 now. But let me just tell you right now, I'm living the dream. No exaggeration, no put on. I have no reason to lie to you. I'm telling you, I'm loving serving God. I've got my beautiful wife. I've got my three daughters. Two of them got married this year, so now i got two sons-in-law. I'm called to preach. I get to minister with my dad and mom here in the local church. I've got my family here. We live for God, not bragging, but we live for God. We sing for God. We serve God. And I'm telling you right now, serving God is so incredibly awesome. And I can stand here and truly say, I'm astonished. I'm astonished that God gave me his word. And I'm, aston I'm astonished that God's show me his mercy. Now I'm astonished that I've been able to see and feel his power. And I'm astonished that he's got a plan for me and he's used me. I hope you feel the same way. Maybe you've just been kind of floating along in your Christian life. Maybe you've had a spirit that's a little bit apathetic. Why don't right now where you are, get on your knees if you're physically able 
and say, Lord, I'm astonished by you. If you've been cold hearted, kind of bored with your Christianity, why don't you right now confess it to the Lord? Right there where you're at, get on your knees and say, God, I'm sorry. Lord, I've been a cold Christian or I've been a lukewarm Christian. Lord, I've kind of just gotten over you and gotten over what you've done in my life. And Lord, I know it's wrong and I'm sorry. Maybe you've been away from God and you've got to get down on your knees right now like Peter did and said, Lord, I, I, I don't deserve it, but I love you and I'm sorry. And God, I can't believe you'd even deal with me, but Lord, forgive me of my sin and my worldliness and my carnality. I want to get right with you. Maybe even live in powerless Christianity. Why don't you pray right now and say, Lord, I want to see your power by answering my prayers. I want to see your power by working in my life. Why don't you pray for that right now? If you've never surrendered your life to God fully, I mean where you just gave your life to God like these men in this story gave their life to God, why don't you do that right now and say, Lord, here's my life. Take it and use it for whatever you want. Now, if you're going to give God your life for the rest of your life, that means giving God your life for today. Why don't you right now say, Lord, I'm going to live for you each day. I'll do your plan each day. And give the Lord your life. Surrender to God's plan. If you're a young man and God's been talking to you in your heart about being a preacher of the gospel, why don't you surrender to that? Surrender to that right now. Maybe you're a senior just graduating. You know God's working in your heart in some specific way. Hey, senior just graduated, don't run from God's plan. Don't run from God's plan. Surrender to God's plan. I'm glad for how God does things with us that we don't deserve. Father, I pray you'd help young people listening to this message. I pray they would always be astonished by your power, by your plan, by your mercy, and by your word. And God, help them all to serve you for all of their days. And I pray you get the glory from it. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. If you made some type decision today because of the word of God talking to you in your heart, I'd love for you to let me know about it. You could email me, charles.clark at solidrockbaptist.org. Again, charles.clark at solidrockbaptist.org. Let your parents know or your youth leader know you've made a decision. And then email me. I'd love to hear about it, just what it is that God's done in your heart. If your parents and youth pastor don't mind you emailing me about that, I'd love to hear about your decision. So you ask permission and then do that. Young people, have a great rest of the summer. Again, I wish things were different. I wish we'd been able to join together at Shawnee. But God knows all about it. And I believe God's trying to work in our heart through all the midst of the coronavirus mess. We need to just keep looking to God. And don't get over your salvation. Stay astonished. God bless you and thanks for listening.